So welcome everyone to Donald Trump's America. Many of the worst fears that we had with respect to Trump's presidency are now coming true. Recent events over the weekend related to pre the president's executive order on uh, banning refugees and immigrants from Muslim majority countries is really just, uh, in my view, the tip of the iceberg of what we can expect um, over the next four years. Reflecting on this topic over the weekend, Peter Beinart, I think, correctly noted that, quote, after one week as president, it seems pretty clear that either Trump yields or liberal democracy does. During these times of confusion, controversy, and fear, we turn to people who we can trust, people who can make sense of the confusion and the chaos that lies before us. Okay, sorry. Uh, during times of confusion, controversy, and fear, we turn to people whom we can trust, people who can uh, make sense of the confusion and chaos that lie before us, and who can provide guidance on how to navigate the stormy waters that lie ahead. Uh, we especially turn to scholars and public intellectuals who are big picture thinkers and who have a proven track record in presenting a vision for a more humane and just world order. At the top of my list in this category is Martha Nussbaum. Over the course of her impressive career, she has written extensively and influentially in a wide number of fields that include but are not limited to the fields of philosophy, human rights, development, religion and politics, democracy, ethics, education, animal rights, and the politics of India. I often tell my students that there's a small handful of scholars and intellectuals that when they write a book or an article, it's worth your time to stop what you're doing, read what they have written, and to reflect upon it. You will never regret the investment in time. I think Martha Nussbaum is one such scholar. In terms of her more formal resume, she is the Ernst Freud Distinguished Professor. She is the Ernst Freud Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Ethics at the University of Chicago Law School. She also holds appointments in the departments of classics, philosophy, political science, and the Divinity School. She's the author of numerous books, a few of which um, that I can say that I've actually read and I strongly recommend, Not for Profit, Why Democracy Needs the Humanities, Creating Capabilities, The Human Development Approach, The New Religious Intolerance, Overcoming the Politics of Fear in an Anxious Age, Political Emotions, Why Justice Matters for Justice, Why, why Love Matters for Justice, and Anger and Forgiveness, Resentment, Generosity, Justice. Uh, Martha Nussbaum has also received honorary degrees uh, from over 50 colleges and universities from around the world. And recently, she was um, awarded the highly prestigious Kyoto Prize for her contributions in improving the human condition. Earlier this month, it was announced that the National Endowment of the Humanities had selected Martha Nussbaum this year to, to, to deliver the Jefferson Lecture, the US federal government's highest honor for achievement in the humanities. I cannot think of a better person to be with us today during this moment of deep crisis and uncertainty facing our country and our world to speak on the topic of the uh, election of 2016, powerlessness and the politics of blame than Martha Nussbaum. It's a huge honor to have her with us today. Please join me in welcoming her to the University of Denver. Well, thank you very much. It's a great privilege and pleasure to be here. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, okay, so as uh, some of you probably know, I've written quite a lot on the role of the emotions in politics. I've written a recent book on anger and its role in both revolutionary and ordinary politics. Before that, I wrote a book on disgust and its role in the politics of exclusion, and marginalization, particularly with reference to gays and lesbians. And I've written about other emotions as well. Uh, fear became a very big issue in my book on the new religious intolerance. So when the election took place, as it happened, I was in Japan because I was there to get the Kyoto Prize. And the news of the election came like on the, the day that I was supposed to go off there and get the prize. So if you see the YouTube video of the prize, you'll see a certain amount of sleeplessness and, and perhaps strained smiling or something. But in any case, I was sitting there in this place where I knew no one and I didn't have anyone to talk to. 
And so that made my mind start work, whirling away in the middle of the night. And I decided what I needed to do was to write about what I thought. And, and it, I actually ended up getting some new ideas, which in some serious ways changed my basic approach to the emotions, putting fear in a much more central and foundational place toward both anger and disgust than it has been before. So, so I sat and wrote, and I wrote some of what you'll soon hear. But then I, and so then that became a book proposal. I have a contract with Simon & Schuster, and I have to actually write this book by September 1st. But in the um, meantime, of course, I also am going to put some of it into the Jefferson Lecture. So it's very much a work in progress, and it will be my great privilege to have some reactions from you to these ideas about emotions, which, of course, immediately pertain to our situation. But I, I do believe it's the job of philosophy also to step back and take us deeper and to help us examine ourselves before we can move forward. So when people feel themselves powerless, out of control of their own lives, and fearful for themselves and their loved ones, it is all too easy to convert that sense of panic and impotence into blame and the othering of outsider groups, immigrants, racial minorities, and also women. They have taken our jobs. The problems that globalization creates for working class Americans are real, deep, and very difficult to solve. But rather than face those difficulties and uncertainties, people all too easily grasp after villains. And a fantasy takes shape. If we can somehow keep them out let's say build a wall, or keep them in their place, keep women in subservient positions, we can regain our pride and our masculinity. When a leader tells people that these fantasies are true and reinforces them, great danger to democracy is created. Uh, of course, we're all vividly aware of the immigration issue. There's no need to even uh, mention that since it's on our minds, but I think equally dangerous uh, in the long run has been the appeal to misogyny. The depiction of women as sex objects, the disgust with female flesh that has been exhibited, and um, of course the depiction of women as a kind of animal, which is very awful for the othering of animals, among other things. So uh, both women and animals are being put in their place. So blame divides us when what is most needed is a constructive and cooperative approach to an uncertain future. At this time of crisis, I think we need many disciplines and many different things. We need good economic ideas, wise approaches to the political dysfunctions in Washington, a spirit of patience and openness, and also a spirit of disciplined protest. But we also need deeper understanding, and that's what I hope that philosophy will be able to supply. So uh, as someone who spent a long time working on the nature of the emotions and their role in political life, I, that, that's what I, I decided was my job to do. I think it's urgent for us to understand ourselves better, to see how our nation has arrived at this state of division, hostility, and non-communication. And I do believe that a philosophical approach focused on a close look at the human emotions offers that understanding of ourselves. Socrates examined life, except with more attention to psychology than Socrates himself supplied, uh, which then, I, I believe, can also offer us strategies of hope and connection. Now. The politics of blame, I believe, begins in fear. We are helpless when we come into the world. Human beings are physically helpless for a long proportion of our lives. It's very different from any other animal species. We see and understand quite a lot, but can't move at all and can't do anything to get what we want. And uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau remarked very 
sagely, that that means that babies feel they have to make slaves of other people, because that's the only way that they're going to get what they want. And so Rousseau actually thought that deep in the structure of human life begins m monarchical politics and a deep danger for democracy. And I agree with that now. So in their inchoate mental life, infants thrust into a world of need and pain, fear that all these good things, food, secure, embrace, bodily comfort, will be withheld. They can't do anything about them. And that experience of helplessness informs us that the world is erratic and unpredictable. Typical reaction to that painful situation, as Rousseau said, is to try to grasp at the sources of the good things, but that means controlling other people. This reflex from the fear of deprivation and pain to the project of bossing others around persists as an undercurrent, I would say, sort of nibbling around the edges of democracy at all times and then brought into sharp relief in a time of crisis. And of course, Rousseau was writing at the very beginning of democracy, and he knew that it was an uphill battle to create that, and it was also a, a, a constant battle against human psychology to sustain it. So the other people don't yield to the attempts we make to control them. Parents and caretakers come and go, not always obeying our wishes. As we grow older, other children threaten our security, both inside the family, our envied siblings, and outside of it. And the very conditions of human life itself, the scarcity of love, of jobs, of support, the illnesses and deaths of parents and loved ones, episodes of pain, loneliness, and illness in our own lives make us continually fearful, all the more when we understand as we grow older that our life is finite and that death is its inevitable end. Frustrated in our efforts to control the world, we often react by blaming other people. Blame gives the illusion of control. If my mother dies in the hospital, it's very difficult to accept the fact that the world is just like that, and there's nothing I can do about it. Loved ones die, loss is omnipresent, and grief an all-too-present reality. But if I can say, those doctors did it, I'll sue the doctors, I have the illusion of control. I've converted my fear and helplessness into some semblance of purposive action. This dynamic plays, I think, a huge role in today's US politics. Globalization is very mysterious. It operates it out of our understanding, and even sophisticated economists don't really fully understand it. And while it brings gains to some people, it does bring loss and great insecurity to many, particularly to a group of working class high school educated people in the US. Incomes have been flat, and so while incomes in developing countries go way up, there's what's, uh, what's called the, the rabbit-shaped curve by economists. So it goes up like some ears, then it goes down where the, the American uh, lower middle classes uh, come. So, and then when the American elites, it goes back up again, so the other ear is there. So the intractable mystery of why some lives are suddenly worse than they were before is much easier to endure if people can just blame someone else. Those immigrants have the jobs that I should have. Those women have come in to the workforce and they've taken my job. Or on the other side, and I think this it happens also on the left, though perhaps in a somewhat different way and in a lesser degree, those big banks, those Washington elites have taken away my quality of life. And it, of course, it's not really that simple. When political leaders tell people there is an easy target and that they're not simply helpless, as I fear happened with this immigration order, people feel better. You know, people are reacting on the whole well to that order because they feel more in control. Something's being done. They've done it. So converting fear into blame, they feel that they have a plan of action and someone powerful who will carry it out. In this way, fear 
feeds and underlies retributive anger. And anger is the highly volatile and dangerous offspring of fear. The blame game is usually unproductive. In personal relationships, and I wrote about this in my, my recent book on anger, so there's a chapter on personal life, a chapter on what's called the middle realm, that is workplace anger, anger at airline personnel. That's my big Achilles heel, I fear. Um, when, when you can convert fear into blame, you feel powerful. But in fact, in personal relationships, when we turn the insecurity that's always part of human love into aggression, as with divorce litigation, child custody disputes, and so on, we form diseased relationships of domination and subordination, and we fail to face constructively our own future. Objectification of women and violence against women are typically caused more by fear than by real hatred, I think, and, but it's convert, fear converted into blame control, and I'll come back to that example in a minute. In politics, fear-driven blame provides the illusion of things getting better without actually facing and solving the underlying problems, and this aggression is a source of great danger since it can all too easily lead to violence. Uh, I've worked a lot in India, and I have to say that I've witnessed in India the conversion of fear and blame, the politics of blame of Muslims in Gujarat in 2002, uh, which was based on a fear of Muslims taking Hindu jobs. A campaign slogan was about the high fertility rate of Muslims, and they're going to come in and take your job. And that was turned into violence, and thousands of innocent Muslim civilians were killed, and the man who did that was a mass murderer who was denied entrance into the United States for many years because he was known to be a mass murderer, is now the Prime Minister of India. So there are there's a lot to fear. Now we turn to another emotion, namely disgust. And here now I'm revisiting my earlier views about disgust. Human beings also have a natural reflex to feel revolted by our own bodily waste products and other things that psychologists who work on disgust call animal reminders. That is, things that remind us not of any part of animality, because of course animals are beautiful and strong and wonderful, but only of the things that we fear in ourselves. Mortality, feces, bad smell, and so on. So, by itself, this primary disgust reflex is probably based on evolutionary tendencies, and it's relatively benign in the sense that it, it doesn't really track very well the sense of danger. Psychologists have shown that actually it's what you think the object is, not the way it actually smells, that determines the disgust reflex. So if you think it's cheese, you're not disgusted. If you think it's feces, you are disgusted. So it doesn't really track the sense of danger, but it still probably does a reasonably innocuous job of steering us away from some genuine sources of danger. However, when we get through with that, that's not the end of the disgust game. We also, in every known society, people project disgust properties onto people that they fear and they want to control. Vulnerable minorities, racial groups, immigrants, women. The dominant group fantasizes these people are in some way contaminating to the pure body of the dominant group. They're dirty, they're hyper-animal, they're in some way uh, polluting to pure people. I've just had a big conference in India at our university center in Delhi where we com compared the disgust rhetoric of the caste system to the disgust rhetoric of uh, fear and disgust against African Americans in the US, but also disgust with people with disabilities, disgust at people who are aging, that's something I'm writing about myself now, disgust uh, directed at Muslims and, and, and other groups as well, and of course misogyny uh, very centrally. So this fear disgust reflex gives rise to what I've called projective disgust which is a major component in racial and gender exclusion and in at least some forms of reaction to Muslims. I think disgust is more 
prominent in rhetoric about Muslims in India, where the hyper bodily nature of Muslim women was used as an uh, incentive to rape and also murder Muslim women in the Gujarat riots. It's more fear than disgust in the US, but in any case, it's all a, a horrible mixture. But I now believe that disgust doesn't turn into projective disgust on its own. And so the new thing that I, I, I now feel I've come to understand is we really can't understand how that happens without seeing how projective disgust is rooted in fear, and in particular, fear of our own animality and mortality, which human beings just simply do not accept. And because fear is in a certain way justified in the sense that we, we really are very vulnerable in the world and very insecure, it's difficult to master and keep control over this dynamic, not without dealing with our underlying fears to at least some extent. Racism, misogyny, other forms of group hatred are consequently endemic to human social life. We see the fear disgust dynamic indeed in the earliest fairy tales told to children in more or less all cultures. There's a hideous, bad looking, ugly, villain, a witch, an ogre, who is both malign and powerful, but also physically disgusting in some way. The child in the story is threatened by this hideous figure, but emerges safe and sound when she manages to obliterate the disgusting object. Typical is the story of Hansel and Gretel, in which the two children not only make the witch explode in her own oven, but also rescue all the other blonde German children whom she has ensnared. Now, I mean, and I've actually uh, wondered whether Humperdinck, who was a, a pupil of Wagner and who was very much uh, a part of early German anti-Semitism, whether this myth had a productive result in the particular way in which Jews were killed in the Holocaust. Our current political moment is uncannily close to this fairy tale. There's a prevalent fantasy that fear will be removed and will be safe and sound if we only remove the disgusting other, or at least, and I think Mexicans are clearly portrayed as disgusting, sort of vermin-like creeping over the border. If we at least build a big wall, we will be uh, safe. This fear disgust dynamic is deep. We know experimentally that human beings are programmed to fear certain shapes, in particular the shape of the snake, but the snake, sinuous and imagined as slimy, though of course snakes are not slimy, links the core objects of fear to disgust, and probably that is an evolutionary dynamic. This dynamic may have served us well in some prehistory. In our current time, it's easily hijacked to fuel discrimination against immigrants and against others of all sorts. What is it about our own time that has made the tendency to misogyny, racism, and other forms of exclusion so prominent? I believe it is the underlying fear and, and real insecurity of the modern economic moment, which is particularly painful consequences for many American workers. And as I say, no one really understands what's going on. So it's no surprise that people in pain themselves can't figure it out and turn for comfort to this blame the minorities fantasy that is fueled by fear, but then compounded by a constructed disgust. They're animals, they're not white like us, they will pollute our communities and so on. Now this fear blame dynamic then joins forces with the fear disgust dynamic in a toxic brew of negativity. Blame of immigrants, women, and minorities is coupled with the representation of these groups as in some way revolting contaminants we need to keep away from our, our clean bodies. This same dynamic, I think, it does uh, it, it express itself also on the left in some of the disgust that one hears for working class white men and their bodies, and uh, of course, um, it's a substitute for a really powerful critique of the economy that could be made. 
But now I want to turn to misogyny, which I think is a very central problem in all of, all of this uh, political moment, ubiquitous and profoundly tenacious. I think the tenacity and the upsurge of misogyny owes a lot to the dynamic I've described. All men, so far at least, are born out of women's bodies. Thrust from a world of comfort into a world of fear, the fearful infant soon develops resentment toward the maternal body that used to support its needs, and maybe it feels, well, now I don't control that anymore. I'm not part of this symbiotic harmony. And eventually this dynamic, which is universal at first, can, needn't, but can take on a gendered aspect. Males resent the power of females over their well-being, and they associate that power with the fertility they also envy, and with female bodily fluids, that are both desirable and all too often under the influence of culture, disgusting. It's easy to suppose that problems come from the power of women and that success requires humiliating them and keeping them in their place. Now this dynamic, which involves, I think, both blame and disgust, can be amply illustrated from the rhetoric of the president in the current campaign. But I'm going to illustrate it for now with an example that was uh, in, involved law school and that you may know about if you're law students out there. Uh, law schools used to be, of course, overwhelmingly male, and that happened for a very long time. Today, women hold about half of the places in law schools in America. And in a time of economic decline, the number of places and the number of jobs are both shrinking. Many men, therefore, blame their insecurity and their possible joblessness on women. There was a website called Auto Admit, which purported to be a website that gave advice about law school admissions. However, very quickly, it turned into something quite different. What it really contained was pornographic, but also disgust-laden stories about the bodies and the sexual activities of named female law students students that were clearly known to the people who were doing the posts. The posts were anonymous, but the women were not anonymized. They were named, and their bodies were described in enough detail that, we, that they knew this was somebody in my class who had seen me. So evidently, they were known classmates of the anonymous posters, and it was written in such a way, and the website even gave advice on how to do this, that it would quickly go to the top when you Googled that woman's name. So when the posters were tracked down, and that was very difficult to do because they were anonymous. Uh, the women, meanwhile, were not getting the jobs that they should have gotten. And so there were two women at Yale Law School who in the lawsuit are referred to only as Jane Doe 1 and Jane Doe 2, but in the uh, blog they, they were named. They tried to track down the posters to sue them for defamation and damages, but that wasn't really usually possible because they were just these pseudonyms. There were only two who were identified, and those two were mediocre law students who were not getting good grades, and they had failed even, one of them had not actually even been accepted to any law school. So it was a sense of insecurity and a fear of failure, and that was laid at the door of successful female classmates and people at Yale Law School, and discussed mingled with blame, both powered by an underlying fear. Modern day misogyny is, I think, in many ways comparable to European anti-Semitism in the disgust for the bodies of a group and fictive blame of that group for people's economic woes is combined with a sense of the group's power and success potential, which has to be taken down. And that leads to a new ingredient in the toxic brew, which is envy. And there's a lot, going to be a whole section in, in the book on envy, but I'm not going to talk about that more now. Maybe in the um, question period I will. But now I want to turn to what the positive alternative might be. Real problems are difficult to solve. Fantasies of purity and retribution are much more consoling than the sticky and recalcitrant reality. We've known this forever. We tell ourselves comforting stories in which the ugly, blameworthy villain is obliterated, the witch goes into the oven, or as in the biblical book of Revelation, 
the pure people drive their hideous enemies into oblivion. But what is the other possibility? We know intellectually what it is, constructive problem-solving work combined with hope and cooperation. But how do we make this real in our hearts when emotions so strongly prompt us to recoil from people with whom we need to cooperate? Uh, my, my great hero in this book really is Martin Luther King Jr. And I think he understood that this problem of recoil is a problem on both sides. Then he was addressing as much his supporters as the opposition when he asked for constructive work and hope. Compassionate love is not an easy sentiment, and it's not a pretty sentiment, as King often said. He, he, whenever he mentioned the word love, he said, now I don't mean romantic love, and I also don't mean that you gotta like the people. I mean a love that takes work, self-discipline, and will. But if we understand that our emotions, despite their roots in natural tendencies, are also culturally constructed and malleable, we know that this work can bear fruit. There are many wonderful examples of spiritual discipline and hope that have appeared in this difficult moment. I think of the reactions of the members of that South Carolina church when their friends and relations were murdered and they turned to their enemy with unconditional forgiveness. The reactions, I think even more surprising in a way, reactions because they were disciplined very much by their pastor, but the spontaneous reactions of the gay and lesbian community after the slaughter in Orlando, when instead of demonizing anyone, they simply manifested in their public demonstration the eloquent beauty of love, and they just said, look, love is stronger than hate. So we need spiritual and emotional leaders who can get us to turn around and face the future in a spirit of openness to others, tolerance, and constructive cooperation. We can find this leadership in our communities. Some will find it in religious communities, some in employment groups or other causes they work with. And I think in my own city, which is said by the president to be a terrible mess and a disgusting place that has no hope, actually, I see many groups working every day with great determination and great hope. But we also need politicians who manifest the power of love and hope in their manner of needing this moment. I can mention, again, on the local level, many of them. I am in touch with people, young politicians, young Congress people. But in any case, we need to demand, and we have a right to demand politicians like that. Most of all, we need ourselves and our own committed political action. Martin Luther King Jr.'s vision of a future when little black boys and little black girls would join hands with little white boys and little white girls. When we hear it today, it sometimes seems like a, a nice cliche. But at that time, in 1968, it was a really difficult message for both whites and blacks in his audience. We need a similar vision of an American brotherhood. And that means often, I think, that we need to envisage joining hands with people we don't always like, even the Trump supporters. If we don't like them, we still know that those are real people who have deep insecurities and concerns, and they're, not, uh, they're, they're just not uh, to be turned away from in disgust. So I think we must energetically condemn and work against acts of misogyny, demonization of immigrants, racism. But we must, while condemning those acts, and this is something, again, that King emphasized always, while condemning the acts, we must embrace people and not assume that people are hardened villains through and through. We must embrace the people while condemning their acts, and above all, we must try to embrace and overcome ourselves. Thanks.
questions from the floor? Yeah, I think, okay. I think we Let me just make a quick announcement. And okay. Return. okay, we have time for questions and answers. And if you have a question, please line up behind the microphone, given the size of the audience and given the fact that we have to leave by 1.30, um, because Professor Nussbaum has another lecture that she needs to deliver. I ask everyone to keep their questions or comments as short, as succinct, and as uh, direct as possible. Micheline, first question to you. Well, she said the Democratic Party has been criticized for not focusing on class politics, on the issues of white working class men, but instead stressing identity politics. I think to some extent that's misplaced in the following sense, that I think what is called the politics of identity is actually a politics of justice and inclusion. It's the demand that African Americans, that Latinos, that women be, and gays and lesbians be justly included in the economy. Now, oddly, of course, gays and lesbians were there already, so it's not, they're less the object of the blame rhetoric, simply because everyone knows that they're not new. I mean, they were always there, although they were closeted. But all these other groups deserve their due and fair place. And so, of course, to win a place for someone who has been ostracized, who has been portrayed as disgusting, it's a long job that requires defeating again and again this hydra monster of fear and disgust. And you know, when you think back to the civil rights era and you read what people were saying then and the her terrible disgust rhetoric that was used to keep African Americans in their place. My colleague Justin Driver has just, for our conference in India, wrote a, an amazing paper that brought out from obscurity remarks that people, even Dwight Eisenhower, made. Dwight Eisenhower said, we must not let those big black bucks sit next to our little blonde-haired girls. He said that about elementary school integration. So, you know, I mean, he, his biographers denied that he had said that, but now it's documented that he did say it. So when that was said only a little while ago, you know, it hasn't gone away. And to fight that, you do need to focus on that. And you do need to focus on the place that African Americans hold in our country. And where women are concerned, it's, I think, even, if anything, tougher, because giving women their due place means a lot of things that people have not faced up to, such as child care, appropriate parental leave, elder care. Most European countries have gone much further than we have, for example, making nursing care available. But in this country, nursing care, unless you're rich, is available only if you're family does it for you. And so that means women are doing it by and large, and they're supposed to do it out of love. So, you know, we need to focus especially on the problems of women because it means change in the way we think about the household responsibilities for people who are aging. Not that we're doing that, we're not doing it, but we need that. So that's a reason why focusing on that is important. I think a lot of the people who say it's identity politics mean we don't want to face that difficult struggle of including those groups. We would rather just have business as usual, and we want the white men to be the focus. Now, having said that, so I think a lot of the blame of identity politics is misapplied. I do think that white working class men have real economic problems. And the largest problem, really, is that the American dream, which used to be real for immigrants and for people who have been here for a number of generations. Namely, you work hard, and then you'll do pretty well, but your children will do even better than you did. That dream is no longer real for many, many people. And one reason it is not real is the huge escalation of costs of higher education. Now, the Democratic Party did face that to some degree. But I think not enough. I mean, I do think Bernie Sanders faced it in a utopian way, which was not accompanied by practical policy proposals. Hillary Clinton faced it more, more realistically, calling for state universities to be free of charge for people. But I think the problem is that what you do need to do is to make entry possible for everyone 
while still making the rich people pay tuition. The idea that Harvard should be, to, should be free of tuition is just an, uh, it's a very regressive economic policy because the burden will fall ultimately on the middle class and the rich people will get a free ride. So I'm not in favor of that. And you have to craft university policies that are, that are going to make rich people who can pay the tuition pay while making it available to everyone. So no one has really done that yet. And I think it, some private universities have done better than, uh, than the public universities because they're rich and they can try to do a lot with scholarship aid. But let's face it, professional education and especially legal education have not caught up at all because legal education used to be, you know, everybody paid full tuition because you assumed you get a high paying job when you got out, but that's no longer the case. But still, legal education is very, very expensive for most people, and there's not nearly enough scholarship aid. People end up being heavily in debt. So all these issues are really, really need to be addressed, or else it will make sense for people to say, well, the American dream is gone. And if that, 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 that narrative that made life hope for most people. That narrative was real when I was a kid. And uh, if, when I think about my father, who came from a working class background, became a partner in a Philadelphia law firm, paid for elite. He had a not elite college education, but then he, he went to Mercer in Georgia. Good place, but not elite. And then I went to elite schools. So that kind of dream that if you work hard and you do well, your children can do even better. We have to bring, we have to think what that is in the new era and what are new ways of making that real. And I think right now, the focus of the economic policy of the current administration is not realistic because it's all about, oh, let's save a few hundred manufacturing jobs here and there. But the fact is, manufacturing jobs are not where the future of the working class and lower middle class are. They have to get a college education because the new economy requires skills. It's different from the old economy. And so what, in, instead of the very expensive and difficult job of thinking about universal college education, the current administration is just playing a catch-up game. Oh, let's snatch a few manufacturing jobs. And, and that, that, that is not enough. So I think people need to devote attention to that future. And I don't see anyone really doing that. Yes, uh, thank you for your uh, very interesting talk. Uh, uh, given the uh, degradation and denigration of women that we saw during the campaign, I was puzzled why 54% of white women, if I've got that statistic correct, uh, voted for Trump. Could you, uh, w would it be connected with uh, fears that white women might have, that white women had, uh, which led them to blame perhaps Hillary for their problems? Maybe you envy? Would you, would you yeah, I, I think, um, well, of course, there's first of all the fact that a lot of these women depend on the well being of the men in their households. And they're doing badly to the extent that those men are doing badly. They're in solidarity with the pain of the men. And, you know, in that sense, it's reasonable for people to, to go along with the politics of the men. Uh, I also do think that Hillary did not connect with those women. I mean, Hillary has many uh, good attributes, but the common touch is not among them. And she, she just doesn't, I mean, you know, it's kind of as if I were to go on the campaign trail, I would be a terrible failure in, in connecting to the women that you're talking about. And, uh, and, and so we need politicians who can really understand in a deep way from either from their own experience or from a cultivated imagination, the struggles of these working uh, women. I think our new senator, Tammy Duckworth, who lost both of her legs in Iraq, she's somebody who, who does understand because she's lived the life of the military and she's been, you know, so there, there are people out there who can speak to the women that you're talking about. But I do feel that the Democratic Party did not do that. I don't think Nancy Pelosi is somebody who does that. I think that we need a generation of women who are themselves working class women, who are not elite professionals like Hillary from 
you know, elite law schools, Yale Law School, and so on. And um, the Democratic Party had better be looking for that. I think Elizabeth Warren does a little bit better at connecting because she just is a, a, a more connecting sort of a speaker. But let's face it, she's a Harvard Law School professor. We cannot have the whole Democratic Party made up out of Ivy League professors. It, it just is a recipe for disaster. Yeah, thank you. Next question. Uh, thank you. Uh, 30 years ago, I read Art of Loving by Eric Fromm. And in poetry, Rumi, uh, almost exactly mirrors the same thought. In politics, I think I love Jimmy Carter, but Jimmy Carter was not running last year. Yeah. Yes. So uh, what do you suggest in practical politics? Uh, yeah, I, 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 thank you for mentioning Rumi. I was just reading, I guess it was in the either the New York Times Book Review or the New York Review of Books, a review of a new biography of Rumi. So I was just thinking of that example, which is a very beautiful example. Um, no, I mean, politicians can do badly if they have too much of a poetic vision of the world. And I think Jimmy Carter did, did not combine it enough while he was in actual politics with real life political savvy. I think Obama has also a very poetic imagination, and he had pretty, pretty intractable obstacles. But to some extent, too, I, th I think it, the trouble is that the people who are poets in their hearts often disdain the messy work of politics. And that's a real problem with democracy. I mean, one of my heroes, even though I find him an awful, re re reprehensible, individual is Lyndon Johnson, because in one of the, I mean, I would almost say he's disgusting because of his vileness, but he, he knew how to get the bill passed. And he knew whether it was by threats or by bribes. Uh, and, you know, this is something, unfortunately, you, you need a di different combinations of people, I guess. And you got to have, um, to go back in history, you've got to have Emperor Akbar, who knew how to get things done and how to bring policies of religious toleration into reality. And then you need the poet Kabir to be the poetic voice of religious toleration. So um, obviously, the Democratic Party has to think about that. I think there are some younger people. And I think, interestingly, you know, there were two um, Indian Americans who were both elected to Congress this year, whom I know. Personally, one of them is a former student of mine, Ro Khanna from Silicon Valley, who had to bring together a group of you know, elites in Palo Alto, Silicon Valley, with working class communities in East Palo Alto. And he had a very effective campaign of reconciliation and hope. And, uh, and I've read, of course, I know him personally and, and know what he stands for and read some of his speeches, also in my own uh, city. Roger Krishnamurti, who is a small businessman who has really wonderful things to say, and I think comes from a part of the Democratic Party that does, it connects to working people because that's who he is. And so um, you know, his name is a bit of an obstacle, but when people say, oh, what's this name? He just says, just call me Raja, you know. And so I, uh, you know, as a friend of India, I follow these careers particularly, but anyway, I think there are lots of young people who have that, uh, some combination of real life savvy with a with a more poetic vision, but let's hope that we can combine different sorts of people. Because look, King was not in electoral politics; he would not have done well in electoral politics. So we needed the combination of King with the the Democrats who who did the political work. So so let's just hope that as we move forward, we can find those combinations. Thank you, Professor. Uh, do we hope for a messiah? I guess my, my point is uh, I'm, I'm trying to leave here with, with some, uh, some sense of, of hope. I mean, beyond, beyond just going home and trying to talk to my kids and saying, you know, and trying to educate children, uh, you know, we, well, the, the folks we face uh, will not give up the power. 
I, let me, let me, I, I don't believe, and if it's a question of power and developing compassionate love and opposition to power and talking to the powerful, and uh, I, I think it's been, it's been that way for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, speaking truth to power in a humorous kind of, you know, uh, nonviolent way is, is the way. And I guess with hope, yeah. and maybe, maybe that's what you're, you're talking to us about is generating some own, some virtues in ourselves that, that can, that can lead the fight, you know. Um, I'm just, uh, you know, I want to march out of here saying, you know, well, I, I, you know, we're going to do that. And I know how to do that because, because you know, and, and I'll just say this too. We talk about Bernie Sanders. I, God bless Bernie Sanders. I voted for him. But, but damn, you know, he got screwed with, with, with the good old people and, and the Dem party that I'm supposed to go and support now who, you know, Nancy Pelosi, I'm not trying to get on my, I'll get off my pulpit now. Yeah, you, but that's well, it. Thank you know, I think that where I see hope coming from is local efforts and local communities. And in each, you know, around Chicago, my Jewish temple has the largest food garden that provides food to the poor, fresh food to the poor in the US. So that those kinds of efforts bring people together produce group solidarity, and then give rise to movements that can help to make political change. Now, as I said, I think we need different kinds of characters. We need you know, the, 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 the more um, Messiah-like people, but then we need hard-nosed politicians who really know how to get elected. And so I think what we need to do in our local communities is to do the projects that nourish a sense of compassion and hope in ourselves, but also figure out how to elect people to Congress that share our values, even just something like helping to fund worthy people and helping them run for office. We also need our law schools to get involved in social justice projects. My students are working on a lot of very important clinical projects. So I think there are a thousand things we can do. And what's important is that every person decide where am I placed here and now? What are my resources? What are my opportunities? But I think at least part of that has to be focused uh, toward electoral politics, not so much running oneself, but figuring out who are the people who are, have the particular abilities to make political change possible. I mean, Bernie Sanders was a good speech maker, but I think not an effective politician in the end because his policies were utopian and unrealistic. He got his start at the University of Chicago as a, a, a kind of civil disobedience worker for racially integrated housing, and he was superb at that. And in fact, a, a, a real follower of King in the highest sense. I just had to write a history of civil disobedience and found that his work in that, those days were absolutely exemplary. Uh, but you know, as I say, it, it takes different kinds of people and the kind of people who can really create political change in Washington are different from the people who can generate idealism and hope and enthusiasm. And, and those two need to be both there. We also need well-trained law students who will go out and clerk for judges who will write a lot of the important opinions in these areas, and we need uh, to, to give all of those people our support. So, you know, to law students who are here, I would say you have a future that's connected to your profession, and it might mean that you go into electoral politics, but more likely it means you just do the legal work that you need to do. This country needs many different kinds of people, but, but I do feel that in the civil rights movement, what happened was that all these different groups of people came together. Very, not very admirable politicians like Johnson, an idealistic leader like King, but then many, many young people, older people from all walks of life came together. And uh, interfaith groups from churches, synagogues, and mosques were a big part of that. So anyway, I just think that's what needs to happen, that we start local, and then bring these groups gradually together on a national scale. The next question. Um, Please speak into the microphone. Yeah. So uh, I come here with a sense of fear because I, uh, 
I recognize I have enormous respect for your intellectual firepower. I don't know that with any, of any academic that is, has competencies in so many different areas, and I respect that and admire that a lot, but I disagree with you on a couple of points. Um, the, I've spent a lot of time in, we're in, in high testosterone areas, locker rooms mm -hmm. of rugby and football teams, uh -huh. Wall Street, men, in my experience, do not feel disgust for the female body. Now, there may be orthodox religions who, <clears throat> where men are reluctant to shake hands with women or feel that women are dirty or disgusting. But the men that I know, from the, from, in my experience, do not, their, their reaction to the female body is the opposite of disgust, believe me. And I also spend time in uh, Texas, where we reside, back and forth, where the, there, you said that there's a disgust for the Mexican worker. On the contrary, even among working class whites in Texas, and I, I, my experience here is less, uh, in, 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 among working class whites. There's tremendous admiration for the hardworking Mexican worker. You, 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 you observe on the highways of Texas, on a road crew, the brown faces are the ones with a bandana doing all the hard work. There may be a black lady directing traffic with a yellow vest on, and the white foreman is sitting in the, on, on, the, on the backhoe. Can you the, question? Yeah, no, I, 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 okay, I, so, I don't, the, the disgust for women, the uh, disgust for Mexicans, and the, for both with respect to Trump's uh, executive order, I think that the, the, the white working class is concerned about jobs. It's not a racial thing. And, and witness all the billions of dollars that have been pledged to be spent after Trump okay. was elected. You, you, let me try to respond to each of those. I mean, first of all, about the immigrants, I, of course I would agree with you that people who actually employ and work with Mexican workers uh, know how hard they work. And that's why in states like Texas, the business leaders have long wanted a sensible approach to immigration and why a politician like even George W. Bush would support a, a sensible approach to immigration. It's really people who don't know them, for whom they, they acquire a kind of fantasy life of their own, that there are these you know, vermin sneaking across the border who are taking away our jobs, which of course, as you, as, as you know, people who actually work with them know that that's not true. They're working very hard at jobs that most Americans do not want to do. So, I, and of course, it only, it, it doesn't have to be a universal sentiment. It, it only needs to be the sentiment of a decisive segment of the population. And fantasies are often not based on real acquaintance with the people involved. I mean, how many people who said those things about African Americans that I just reported had actually gone to school with an African American, right? Not one. So as far as women go, you know, it's two, two complicated sides of the same coin. Uh, yeah, of course, men don't exactly express disgust for women's body, unless the women have a menstrual period, in which case, you know, Trump said that, right? And you, you know that case. Uh, or unless the women seem to them to be a little overweight or have a big rear end. The shaming of women's flesh in terms of fat shaming, that's a huge blot on many, many women's lives. Women in my own university locker room that write anonymously on the wall things about fat shaming and their own sense of the horrible um, dislike of their own bodies that comes from that. So yeah, if you would live up to the perfect stereotype, which now is a stereotype that's formed by internet pornography, 
so that even pubic hair now is disgusting. And women are reporting that they view their own pubic hair as disgusting, because, but because men are viewing it as disgusting because that's not what internet porn has. Uh, so, you know, if you live up to that stereotype, you're always uneasy, lest you stop living up to it. But if you don't, of course, then you, you, you fall afoul of it. So the flip side of the attraction is always discussed. And I think the two are very, very difficult to separate, have been for centuries, even Adam Smith in the theory of moral sentiments said about women's bodies, when we have dined, we order the covers to be removed. <laughs> so that was, that was that, right? So anyway, I think, uh, you know, I'm not, of course, not everyone feels that, thank God. <laughs> many, many men <laughs> do not feel that way, but there, there are certainly plenty who, who do, and Trump appealed to it, whether he, actually feels that way about women who are overweight, who knows? But he appealed to that in his audience with very canny, disgust rhetoric. And I have a whole, my research assistant has been gathering instances of misogynistic disgust rhetoric from Trump and other uh, parts of the campaign. So I have a lot of ammo. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much. Um, so I hope this is okay. This is more in the comment um, area. I did not intend to even be here today, nor to get up and speak. Um, I'm actually a little bit nervous, but this is good because I'm going to be speaking here this Thursday night. Um, and, and I decided to say something because I hear people saying, what do we do when we want solutions and where is the hope? Um, it is tough times, but... Um, and I'm trying to learn how to have my own voice. Um, so I'm an author, uh -huh. and I am a 20-year public policy uh -huh. mediator, a colleague of uh, Tamara Pearson Distray here. Um, and again, I did not intend to get up and speak, but I thought it would really be foolish of me to not say, Thursday night, I'm going to be talking about solutions. Good. And, and one of the things to, to go to some of what you're speaking about is, um, the idea that politicians actually do want to do the right thing. And what, in my experience working as a public policy mediator and getting frustrated doing lots of work at agency level and then having the elected officials not move forward, it's where I started to think more about how do we work with elected officials. Mm -hmm. They are surprisingly unaware of all the sorts of tools that places like this teach. And I'll give you a couple of examples just quick. I met with a staffer for one member of the House who is one of the chairs of the Bipartisan Working Group, which is actually a group of Democrats and Republicans that meet every week. And the staffer said that his boss, Jim Renacci, says that's the favorite hour of his week. And he's a Republican. Um, I met with, I actually won't say who, but a senator, um, and I'll tell you what, you'll see why I don't want to say who. And I asked him, I said, what's your favorite hour of the week? He said, it's the Senate prayer breakfast. Because we get together as humans, mm -hmm. and one of them gets up and tells their story. Yeah. And I said to the senator, how could we make more of that happen? And what I was surprised by was he said, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm working on, and again, I, I don't want to monopolize your time, this is your talk, but what I'm trying to promote in this book, and I'm starting to work with members of Congress is, and, and I'll say this out loud, um, because I have a peer who is a chaplain, it's chaplaincy for politicians who have very difficult positions, and no one gives them the support for how to do a better job. And so, if you want to know what to do, it's don't just go to your elected officials and say, vote for this bill. It's say, if you're a student or a faculty here, it's say, let me help you be a mediator, facilitator, elected official, and be that type of a politician. And honestly, I think that is how we will truly change this system, is one politician at a time taking one step at a time, as opposed to wholesale structural changes or even yeah. mass movements. Well, thank you. I think that's really helpful. I guess what I would like to say is that these two activities, the self-examination that I'm urging, and the uh, more practical external activity need to go 
together because we, before we can do the chaplaincy for politicians, we have to think what is it we're trying to cultivate in ourselves and in the country. But, but of course, I do agree that it's not just a matter of voting for this bill or that, but of changing habits of the heart, if you will. And that does happen in cities, like prayer breakfasts that bring police together with church groups. and so, It's much easier to organize on the civic intimate civic level, but uh, all power to you to do it on a more national level. And, and I'm just saying self-examination for the politicians themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with uh, time sort of coming to an end, let's take the last few questions. And Thank you. ask no one else to come up, and then we'll wrap up the other. Okay. Um, on the score of women's rights and animal rights, I think channeling anger as an emotion can also, can be an energy that works in a positive way, not the only focus. Can you opine a bit on that, on how in a political realm we can use anger in a way that's productive and positive? Yeah, okay, great. Well, what I thought about this in writing the book on anger is that there are actually two aspects to anger. One is the, the protest that says this is wrong, and it should not happen again. And then the other part, and, and all the philosophers who define anger include this as a part of anger, is the wish for retribution. And we will pay them back, and we will get cause them pain in return to the, for the pain that they've caused. Now that part is the part that I think we need to get rid of, and we need to move beyond that. Pain for pain doesn't actually help anything. I mean, Gandhi said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And uh, so, so what King thought is, sure, the anger brought people into the movement. They wanted to make someone pay. But what they had to learn was to keep that spirit of outrage, the spirit of protest, but turn from the backward-looking demand for retribution to the forward-looking, uh, let's think what we can do constructively. Let's have work and hope. In the book, I have a technical term called transition anger, which is the kind of anger that just says, that's outrageous, that should not happen again, but there's no wish to harm the one who did it. Now, that's all too rare. I think it's very common in parents relating to young children that we really just want their good in the future, so we're outraged by things they do, but we don't want to make them pay. But in most of life, it's the two uh, have this toxic mixture so that when people get divorced, they, they very often don't just want to say that was outrageous what that person did to me, but they want to say, I want that person to pay, whether it's through a punitive divorce settlement or whether it's just the wish that that person's life would go really badly in the future. But the truth is that what really needs to happen is forward-looking. Let's think what the next step for me is, what will be constructive in this situation. And I think for us who are activists as well, that's the thing, is really just turning from the futile demand for payback to constructive work and hope. But yeah, the, the power of the outrage, you don't want to lose. I'm kind of going back to that gentleman. Sorry. Um, my name is Emily. I'm from the School of Theology next door, ILIF. And, I think you um, need to speak closer. I'm from ILIF. It's next door. We're a school of theology. And if anyone's hiring chaplains for politicians, um, I have my CV. Yeah. The, prob the problem with that job is that you get caught up choosing a specific social narrative. And then those social narratives get used by both sides of the aisles to either you know, justifiably criticize that narrative or to use it and misappropriate it in an incorrect way. Um, is there a way that theology can join that political conversation with, by being bipartisan or more diplomatic, I guess? Well, I think that theology and also religious practice have a huge role to play. And I, I guess I think one problem that I've always found with the academic left is that they are embarrassed, particularly my own profession of philosophy, is that they find religion embarrassing, they don't want to talk about it, and they think that it's a little bit like the return to John Stuart Mill in that era where they think progress will come by just giving up religion and moving beyond that. Well, actually, I, I actually think Immanuel Kant was correct that we're weak people and we need some kind of support group 
to strengthen our resolve and our hope. Now Kant thought it had to come from a religious group. He thought most existing religions were not very good, but we better find the right one and join the church of the right kind. But he did think it had to be religious because he thought only the idea of a higher power would bring people together forcefully enough. Now, I don't believe that. I think there are many groups <clears throat> that can bring people together. But I do think in this country, religious groups are very, very important. And in bringing people together in my own city, I think they are central. <clears throat> and in a lot of the country, I think they're doing a lot of great work. I think there are other communities. I think the gay and lesbian community also brings people together in nonviolent approaches that are hopeful and constructive. And that's an amazing example of a revolution that has by and large succeeded without a single bit of violence and without shedding of blood. That the power of love over hate has, has been that effectively done in that movement. So anyway, I think there are a lot of groups, but I think religious groups, <coughs> just because people are part of them already, really have a role to play. And also because, unfortunately, and I'm sure everyone here knows this, religion has sometimes been on the repressive side of many issues. Lincoln's second inaugural referred to the fact that the slaveholders prayed to the same God as the people who wanted the end to slavery. And uh, he said it would seem strange that a just God would want people to wring the, to, from the sweat of other men's faces, they would wring their bread. Uh, so he, he cast doubt on the rightness of that religious doctrine, and rightly. But so when there are religions that are lining up with repression, then we all the more need to make clear that religions also can support love and inclusion. And uh, I do think uh, that this is a struggle inside every single religion that has struggles about the role of women, struggles about the role of gays and lesbians, struggles over all kinds of issues. And so then we, we really all the more need the power of liberal religion. As a law teacher, I have a lot of the most conservative students in our law school, and they're very talented students because our law school has a good reputation of not marginalizing religious conservative students. So we get a lot of very talented religious conservative students. Those students typically feel that on the other side, let's say pro-gay rights, pro-equality of women and so on, are secular, are atheists who hate religion. And in teaching a class with a conservative colleague, I made a great point of, exchanging theological opinions with them, you know, and saying, well, you know, my religion tells me that service consists in, and worship even consists in fighting for social justice, including justice for gays and lesbians. And so, you know, I think that has a big role to play, especially when a lot of these people who are religious are told by their churches that on the other side are godless atheists who hate them and hate religion. Please join me in thanking Martha. Nussbaum.